3D Design for 3D Printing, Tutorial 3. Today we look at tips and tricks to make parts that fit perfectly to odd shaped objects to take your problem solving abilities to the next level. This video is part of a series on learning 3D design for making custom 3D prints using a free Onshape account. I'll link the playlist below so you can see the previous episodes, including how to make an account and set up your units. In this installment, we're all about matching shapes accurately. In the last installment of this series, we covered how to duct or adapt one shape to another. And I've been using these techniques to design a lot of parts as I connect up dust extraction to the power tools in my workshop. But one particular drop saw does not have a nice tube to attach to. Instead, it has this cut off circle and two mounting bolts and the original piece that's meant to go on here was lost years ago. I need to make an adapter to get this vacuum hose attached securely to the back of this saw. The design techniques in this tutorial are also useful when you're designing a part to fit inside an odd space. First up, as always, are to take some measurements. And if you don't already have a set of digital calipers, I've got an inexpensive set linked in the description. As you can see, the limited workspace means I was limited in the dimensions I could collect here. But I took what I could, drew a simplified diagram of the back of the saw and added the dimensions to it. I also made sure to get the external dimensions of the hose as I would need those to interface correctly with my new part. Finally, rather than try and measure the holes, I took down some various size bolts and test fitted them until I found that the holes were in fact M4. We can't measure a lot of detail, so instead what we need is a reference photo. That's basically a photo with a ruler in place sitting flat on the object with the image taken as square to the ruler as possible. For an odd object like this with wires and clips everywhere, I'd recommend taking a few more reference photos just in case you need to refer to them later. For our cavity example with the car engine bay, I took a series of reference photos, each with the ruler in a different location. Time to hit up Onshape and start a new document. If you are starting from scratch, you can always go to create and then document. But to make your life easier, I'm gonna add this tutorial with the others and you can find the TT Tutorials document linked in the description. Inside this document, I'm gonna create a new part studio by clicking on the plus and then going to create part studio and I'll quickly rename this tab. Like before, we're gonna start a new sketch and I'm gonna draw mine on the top plane. But before we draw anything, the first thing we're going to do is to import our reference image. This toolbar is what you will see when you're editing a sketch. And about halfway across the toolbar, we have a button that says DXF. But if we come to the down arrow, we can insert an image instead as an alternate option. And at this point, we need to click on import and select the image from our hard drive. We've selected the one with the ruler and it quickly uploads. And when it does, we can click on it. Now on shape is prompting us to draw a rectangle that will be the boundary of the image. So I'm gonna click in one corner and then the second. And as you can see, the image is constrained to that. When I drew that, I made sure I didn't snap to anything cause I don't want any constraints. However, if I hover over this line, we can see that it's made a horizontal constraint. So I'm gonna click on that icon and press delete. I'll hover over the other boundaries to make sure there's no other constraints. We need our image unconstrained so we can easily rotate it to get it square as well as scale it to the right size. And we can see versus this blue guideline that the ruler in the image is tilted downwards to the right. So our first step will to correct this by rotating it. So what I'll do is lock one corner, the bottom left, by adding a coincident constraint between that corner of the image and the origin of the sketch. And now when I drag the opposite corner, I should be able to rotate. So let's continue by drawing a horizontal reference line. So I'm just going to do a normal construction line, L for line, and then Q to toggle construction as shown by this icon. And then I'll draw a horizontal line roughly from the corner of the ruler to the right. I'm also gonna do a second horizontal construction line. The length doesn't really matter. And I'm immediately gonna press D for dimension and dimension the bottom of the image and our horizontal line and this dimension will allow us to rotate in accurate increments. So if we zoom in, we can see that we're pretty close. Perhaps I've angled it too much. So I'm gonna put in two degrees for my dimension, drag this to the very corner of the ruler. And now it appears that we're pretty much spot on and our image is now horizontal. 
if yours is still off, just experiment with the dimensioned angle until it's spot on. That's rotation taken care of, so what about scale? We included a ruler so we can get that accurate, and we're going to match it to our reference line. We're once again going to press D for dimension, click on our reference line, and dimension it to be 50mm wide. And if we zoom in, we can see that we're very close to our 50mm line, matching 50mm on the ruler. So to get this exact, we're going to zoom out and dimension the top of our image. The process is as follows. We change the dimension, zoom in and drag our reference line back to the corner of the ruler and then pan across and see how the end of our reference line compares to the marking on the ruler. In my case, the image was too small, so I make the overall image dimension bigger. Again, adjust the reference line to the corner of the ruler in our image and see that this change got me closer towards my target. And after a couple of iterations, I found that my reference line was both aligned with the ruler and matching in length. As the bounding rectangle for our image is black, it means it's fully constrained and we're ready to continue sketching our actual design. The reference line we're actually finished with, so we can drag it over to the side. And from this point onwards, I simply used a combination of circles, lines and arcs as covered in the first part of this tutorial series. I also used constraints such as the equals constraint, to make sure my two circles were even and I used construction lines to bisect my sketch and make sure everything was symmetrical. Of note was that when I dimensioned things, the dimensioned parts match the reference image closely. The ability to validate like this is why it's so important to take some manual measurements instead of just relying on the photo. After adding enough constraints and dimensions, all parts of the sketch are black which means they're fully constrained and we are ready to extrude our sketch to make it three dimensional. So now I can come to the extrude tool, click in the center of my sketch, and as this is an unusual shape when we're aiming for accuracy, we're only going to extrude it one millimeter because we're creating a template to test our measurements first. For me, this step is a no brainer as it takes under 10 minutes and only two grams of filament. I'd much rather find a mistake in a sub 10 minute prototype rather than print the whole thing and find it doesn't fit because I was overconfident. Most of the fiddly work is done, so let's verify the template. Back downstairs to the drop saw and putting the template over the holes for mounting tells us that we're actually pretty spot on. What's not so obvious on camera, but was obvious in real life, is that the corners of the cutout on the actual saw were a little bit tighter than what I had sketched, so that would need a dressing. So far so good, but when I went to put the M4 screws through the 4mm holes to test mount the template, I found that they didn't fit. When I measured the external dimensions of the part, they were within an acceptable tolerance, but the small holes were undersized to the point where a 4mm drill bit had no point of fitting through. So why are these small holes undersized and what can we do about it? Small holes being undersized is actually a common problem with 3D prints, but we can fix it. To understand the first part of the problem, we need to know that our circular cutouts aren't actually circular, but rather a series of straight lines. We can simulate this in Onshape with the dotted line being a perfect circle. And if we increase the segments in the polygon, it more closely matches the circle. But if we bring the amount of segments down, our circular opening becomes jagged and quite undersized. So when we export from CAD, the first thing we should do is set the quality as high as possible. And here is a comparison between the fine dark gray on top and the coarse light gray on the bottom quality presets for STLs from Onshape. That will help, but it's hard to completely solve the problem because we're dealing with the difficult material in that our filament comes out molten. At one point, it will be hot and expanding, and then soon it will cool and contract. And as smart as our slices are, these small holes is where this phenomenon is most likely to show up. Here's three fixes that all work well. Our first option is to use a drill and simply drill the holes to the desired size. However, this is difficult if the hole doesn't extend the whole way through the object. Option two, and my preferred choice, is to simply dimension your small holes in your CAD to be slightly oversized. You'll need some trial and error to determine the right value, but personally I found 0.4 of a millimeter bigger in diameter is the sweet spot. Reprinting the template shows that this is an effective fix, and the fact that all of the files I release publicly have these oversized holes, yet no one complains, tell me that it works well for most people. I'll quite often design parts that instead of using a nut, have the plastic just the right diameter so that a screw cuts its own thread the first time it's inserted. 
If tapping an M3 thread, you would start with a 2.5 mm hole. So if I add 0.4 and make the hole 2.9 mm in CAD, it always seems to turn out the perfect diameter for this purpose. Option 3 is to use compensation for vertical holes in the slicer, such as this XY compensation feature in Super Slicer. Here's the raw output with no compensation. Here's the compensation set to 1mm. And here's compensation set to negative 1mm. If I print the base file with the compensation set to 0.4, we can see that this third solution is also effective, giving us success for 3 out of 3. Which you choose is up to you, just remember to be consistent each time you design parts. The first change I made in my sketch was to add an additional arc that was tighter than what I had previously for the corners. I then used the trim tool, keyboard shortcut M, to remove the unwanted segments. I want a little lip to go inside the hole, so I used the offset tool to click on the perimeter of my shape. I then pointed in the right direction with the arrow before pressing enter and inputting my offset dimension with the keyboard. I can then extrude this new internal shape, pointing it in the opposite direction so it will extend down inside the cutout in the saw. To further help with clearance, I add some fillets or curved edges to this dimensionally critical lip. Finally, I draw another sketch and on it I have two circles that will represent the lip that I want the vacuum hose to insert into. To help the airflow smoothly, I add some chamfers or angles to the inner surfaces so the transition between where the hose comes in and the exit on the saw isn't so abrupt. And to make this even a little bit smoother, I add a fillet on the edge. This part will definitely achieve our intended function, but there is one crucial problem. Throughout this whole series, we've been referring to the same 3D printing considerations, and our design as it stands fails two of these. It doesn't have a flat surface to touch the bed, and that means that we won't be able to avoid using support material. If we import the STL into the slicer, we can see that there's no surface that the part can sit on without having a very big overhang underneath. There are some instances where support material is unavoidable, but this isn't one of them, and we're going to fix the problem by modifying the design. Let's turn this problem into an improvement to the design by splitting this one body into two parts. I'm going to create a new plane and I'm going to click on the underside and then offset up around two millimeters, fixing the direction to make sure that we're cutting a nice amount through the middle of this mounting boss. Let's hit the tick and then come to our next tool, which is in the middle of the toolbar and it is the split tool. The first box will prompt us to select what we're going to split and that's our only part. And now we'll click on the second box and we'll select our plane that we know is going through the middle and instantly we see in the preview that a line has been added where the part will be separated into two. So let's hit the tick and then hide and show some parts to confirm that we have a lower half and an upper half. Each of these can be printed flat. This lower half I'm actually going to print from TPU and it will sit this way on the bed which means it's flat and it doesn't need any support and then the upper half I will do from a rigid filament such as PLA and I've left the bulk of the thickness here so I can clamp it down tight and hopefully get a good seal. While we're on the split tool, let's look at one other way that we can split in a more complicated manner. I'm gonna sketch from side on and I'm gonna use the arc tool and just draw some random curvy lines and I'll make them tangential so they flow nicely. Now when we extrude, there's actually two modes. We've done solid so far, but we can also do surface in this mode, we can use lines that aren't enclosed, such as those that we've drawn, and create a surface rather than a solid body. I'll extend this through my part, and as you're about to see, the split tool will work with this surface. We select our source part the same as before, but for our entity to split with, instead of a plane, we select our surface. We click the tick to complete the split, and if we hide and show parts, we can see that they've been divided in two, but using the curvature we supplied. This is not needed for this part, but it might help you for a more complicated design in the future. Now for the fun part, printing the upper half from PLA, the lower half from a flexible filament called TPU, and that should provide us with the parts that we need to solve our problem. Because of these ridges in the hose, I know it's going to be a tight fit, so I pre-install the hose into the upper half with a little persuasion, place the lower flexible half into the opening on the saw, and I'm pleased to find it has a really nice fit, and then I bolt the upper half into place using the M4 bolts. The other half of the hose goes into a printed adapter I've previously made from my dust extraction tube, and thus my project is complete. 
I've managed to design a very specific part to fit a very specific shape and it does so perfectly. This adapter's been on my to-do list for a couple of years so I'm very pleased to have it done. That's a tick for this project and as we discussed earlier, a scaled reference image also works for designing parts to fit in cavities and it previously let me design an airbox for an opening in a tight engine bay. In the next episode, we'll design another specific part to continue building our skills and knowledge. Thank you so much for watching and until next time, happy designing custom parts for 3D printing. G'day, it's Michael again. If you like the video, then please click like. If you want to see more content like this in future, click subscribe and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really want to support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.